So 70 years, uh, 70 years and still here, I'm going to talk about the randomized clinical trials and its critics. And uh, just of all, first to uh, acknowledge uh, Ursula for the invitation, the EUGM and CITEL as well, and also to say that the historical aspect of this work has benefited greatly from reading articles by Peter Armitage, John Gower, and Nancy Hall about the origins of randomization, and I will talk a little bit about the history. Also a clarification, I'm going to criticize some things that have been said about randomization by some people. The fact that I'm going to criticize, criticize these things does not mean that I disparage the work of these people. In general, that's not the case. But it's, it is the case that I have to pick up on some things. So that might come across as rather negative. Uh, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't uh, take the effort and the time to read what some of these people have to say. So this is just to give you hope that there will be an end to this particular talk. Um, uh, as I should point out, I'm Swiss. That means I will stick to time. That's the good news. The bad news is that this could be the longest hour of your life. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about randomization uh, from psychology to clinical trials via agriculture. Uh, then also give you a game of two dice to explain what I think goes on with randomization. Then uh, briefly touch on what the critics of randomization have been saying then give you the answer to the critics, that's obviously the main purpose of the talk, and then give you some conclusions. So, first of all, uh, where do we get to where we are now? How do we get there? So, um, you could start, I think, by having a look, first of all, at the attempts to formalize the business of experimentation. And it's rather strange to realize that the area, or the, literally the field in which this happened, was agriculture. So, of course, physicists and chemists and other people were doing experiments, but the people who really thought about doing experiments in a systematic way, largely because they knew that the results that they collected were subject to a great deal of error, which you couldn't avoid, were agricultural scientists. And it's Laws and Gilbert who founded an agricultural research station in Rothamsted. They didn't know about randomization at the time, but they were two agricultural scientists who decided that one needed a systematic approach to testing the effects of fertilizers, the effects of sowing methods, the effects of varieties of wheat and so forth on yield. And that's really where the experimentation start, uh, started. But they were not the people who introduced randomization. And a plausible case can be made for saying that that came from psychology. Charles Sanders Peirce, who was uh, he's famous as an American philosopher, was also interested in psychology, and he did some experimentation together with Jastro at Johns Hopkins. And they were looking at the ability to determine the difference between uh, weights of similar weight, the small difference in weights. Could you detect as a human being which of two particular weights was heavier? And in order to do that, they realized it was crucial that you did not know which weight was the heavier before you claimed uh, that you could detect it. You had to be blind in some particular way, and they came across the idea that randomizing the order in which two similar weights, one of which was lighter and one of which was heavier, was given was the key to this. So they introduced randomization. Then, uh, round about 1910, uh, a St Wooden Stratton decided to try and formalize the estimation of error. How could you estimate how much a particular experiment was in error? And this was a crucial thing to do within the agriculture. And uh, Wood happened to know Stratton. Wood was an agricultural scientist based at Cambridge, and Stratton was an astronomer, and they knew each other well. And Wood suddenly realized that astronomers have been combining observations for a long time and trying to use the fact that different observations differed slightly as to the position of a star to estimate to what extent they were actually estimating that position correctly. So they imported the methods that had been used for astronomy into agriculture for the purpose of estimation. But as yet, still no randomization. Then R.A. Fisher started at Rothamsted, not in 1925, but he started in 1919. But as far as I'm aware, the first really published advocacy of randomization, a strong one, came in his 19, 1925 book, Statistical Methods for Research Workers. He developed randomization and very soon realized that errors could occur at different levels. You could have uh, experiments within plots and between plots and so forth. And so you had to understand the error structure, and this also implied something about the richness of the randomization. Frank Yates was Fisher's deputy at uh, Rothamsted when Fisher left in the early 1930s. Yates carried on his work, and he developed factorial experiments and um, also the theory of recovering interblock information. How do we use errors at different levels? Bradford Hill 
Uh, there's some dispute as to how he came across the idea of randomization. He was rather a disciple of Carl Pearson's than Fisher's, but he decided that it was necessary to introduce it into clinical trials. And the first randomized clinical trial, the first modern randomized clinical trial is 1948, and that is 70 years ago, and that's the re reason for this particular anniversary. And then one other key figure, a person uh, with whom I used to share a train journey into from Harpenden during the time I was at UCL, I was living at the place where Rothamsted Research Station is, and that's John Nelder. He developed a very powerful theory which links randomization to analysis. This particular theory is sadly neglected. It's only incorporated in one particular statistical package. That package is GenStat. The net result is that any other package that you use does not analyze experiments correctly unless you are very, very clever. This is true of R and SAS and Stata. All excellent packages, but they don't incorporate John Nelder's theory of general balance. So here is uh, the uh, British Medical Journal announcing the news of the trial, the streptomycin treatment of pulmonary tuberculosis, just over 70 years ago now, end of October, and we're into November. And uh, one of the key figures here is uh, Bradford Hill. So these are some quotes from uh, Armitage, and I'm not going to read through them all. Uh, you'll be able to have a look at them when you get the slides, if you wish, later. But what I want to say, the key thing here is one of the things that, uh, that uh, Bradford Hill is worried about is the possibility that if you don't take steps, there will be some deliberate choice of which patient gets what in a way which could actually bias the results. So one of the reasons that randomization is carried out is to prevent doctors being able to dis prevent them deciding who would get what treatment because Hill fears that they cannot be trusted to do this in a completely neutral way. So to make sure that you can compare control and treatment group in a way that is fair, which is not subject to other biases, uh, that's part of his thinking here. Um, and also, he's also thinking at the same time about the public aspect of this. Basically, you can say he wants to make sure that the experimenter doesn't fool him or herself but he also wants to make sure that the experimenter has an answer to any determined critic. And the answer is this, I did not decide who got the treatment and who got the control. It was just rolling a dice. That's what happened. Essentially, it was a random choice. You can't say it's because I chose all the best patients to go in a particular group. And this public element, this element of trust, is fundamental, of course, to drug regulation, where we have to be sure that the sponsor cannot have biased the results. So I like to refer to the Rothamsted School, key figures all associated with the agricultural research station at Rothamsted. Fisher, of course, uh, he is <coughs> rightly regarded, I think, as being the greatest statistician ever. Also, this is perhaps less well known to us, uh, commonly regarded as being the second greatest evolutionary biologist after Darwin. And in fact, just 100 years ago today, he proposed using the term variance as being the name for the squared scale for variation. And he also proposed using the squared scale for variation as being a means of studying uh, what, what, variance, what variation could be attributable to what particular factor. This was not in his 1918 paper. This was not in connection with agricultural experimentation. He hadn't yet arrived at Rothamsted. It was in connection with inheritance. He was addressing the particular problem, how can one reconcile Mendelian uh, gen genetical inheritance and Darwinian evolution. Before Fisher came along, these were regarded as being two incompatible theories. What Fisher showed was that one was necessary for the other, and he proceeded to explain how much correlation you could expect between relatives of different degrees. What would you expect for two, uh, <clears throat> for two twins? What would you expect for... <clears throat> um, Ordinary siblings, what would you expect for mother and child? What would you expect for uncle and nephew? This sort of thing. Fisher developed a theory based upon um, his particular view of genetics, based upon his application of Mendelian genetics, and he showed that it was actually necessary for Darwinian evolution. Before that, the two were regarded as being independent. So variance is now 100 years old, and that is a key part of the theory, as we shall see. Frank Yates developed um, the theory uh, of experimentation, in particular as regards treatments, 
showing how you could put complicated experiments together and how, if necessary, you could ignore certain levels of interaction in order to estimate these key variance terms. And also, if you had unbalanced experiments, how you could combine information from different strata in order to produce efficient estimates. And then we have John Nelder, who, <coughs> sometime in the 1950s, was doing a complicated analysis of variance, convinced himself that he got it right, but then asked himself the question, how do I know it's right? And how did I know what I just did? And he then spent several years trying to work out exactly how one could produce a formal mathematical theory of what you should produce for analysis of variance. And he came across the key idea of separating block structure, that which is already present in the experimental material before you get to work with it, and treatment structure, that which interests you from the causal point of view and which you will now apply to the blocks. And this is led to his theory of general balance, which is fully incorporated in GenStat, and I may give you just a brief explanation of that. Yes, <coughs> so general balance. It's an idea of John Nelder's, two papers from 1965. They make very, very hard reading. In fact, rumor is that the only person who's really understood them is Rosemary Bailey. Uh, that nobody else has ever succeeded in understanding them. I don't pretend to understand them completely, but I have perhaps enough of a clue to know how to, to, uh, to apply them. And basically, uh, it, it, the two papers, the first one is the null analysis of variance. What would the analysis of variance look like if you hadn't got any treatment applied to the particular block structure that you're working with? Block structure could be plots within, it could be a Latin square, it could be, I mean, it could be rows and columns of a field, it could be subplots within a field, he was thinking in connection with agriculture. For us, it could be patients within centers, for example, in a clinical trial or whatever, or it could be episodes within patients. If we're talking about a crossover trial, we treat patients more than once. This is the block structure. To that, we apply the treatments. And, um, well, I perhaps explain this by an example. I think that's probably the best thing to do. Here, this, by the way, is GenStat now in its 19th edition. Uh, so you define the block structure, you define the treatment structure, then you point the computer in the direction of the design matrix. This is where these factors are stored. Shows how one maps onto another. And then you also tell it what is the outcome variable, and then the analysis of variance is produced automatically. So here's an example. Here I have a um, field experiment designed to study the effects of nitrogen and sulfur on the yield of wheat. Uh, this is a, an example in the help file from GenStats. So I've just picked up this particular example. Uh, there are, in fact, three blocks. And within the blocks, with each block, there are 12 plots. Uh, and I've actually sorted the um, data by the treatment factor. This particular experiment is designed to have a look at the effect of uh, sulfur and uh, nitrate together, um, nitrogen and sulfur, on the yield of wheat with a randomized block design. So what we're interested in as experimenters is nitrogen, sulfur, and the interaction of those two. What we have to live with is that there is already a degree of variation which is not necessarily simple within the field to which we are going to apply this particular treatment structure but we separate these two in our mind and also formally in the model. They're not the same things in the model. It's not just a question of writing down a regression term. Uh, if you have a look, you'll see that nitrogen occurs at uh, three levels and uh, sulfur occurs at uh, four levels, 0, 10, 20, and 40, nitrogen at 0, 180, 230, and they appear in every possible combination. But also in addition to that, within the each block, each combination appears. So we're actually making sure that within each block that we have here, we're using the same particular, uh, particular structure. This is how GenStat works. First of all, I declare the block structure, plots within blocks. Secondly, I tell GenStat what's the treatment, nitrogen interacting with uh, sulfur. By the way, those of you that are SAS users will think of N star S as being the interaction, but in GenStat, it means N plus S, plus the interaction. It's the main effect of nitrogen, the main effect of sulfur, and the interaction. Then I say an ANOVA, the thing in brackets are just what I want to get out, and I tell it yield is the thing I'm looking at, and then away goes GenStat, and it builds the model for me. And this is the model here. First thing you'll notice is there are a number of sums of squares and mean square terms, but only the treatment terms have p-values associated with them you do not get a p-value for the block structure. Why is that? Because the block structure is what it is. 
you didn't do anything to it, it's not why you're doing the experiment, it's something fundamentally different. This is an immediate difference from whatever you do in R and SAS. You, it will not know, R and SAS will not know what is the difference between blocks and treatments. It will treat all of these things just the same. You will have to instruct it in the way in which you build the error model, which is which. Genstat does it automatically, and as soon as the distinction is made, it treats them as being fundamentally different. So what we have here is we have got uh, a statement that, yes, there's a, definitely a significant effect of nitrogen. Yes, there's a significant effect of sulfur. Interaction, not so clear that there is one, but the residual, it identifies the residual is a within-block residual. That's because all of these factors appeared within the particular block. The block stratum itself does not correspond to the residual. It does that automatically from your declaration and from the design matrix. So the morals here are design matters. It matters, the design. The reason I'm thinking about this is because I've just read, actually, um, Judea Pearl's wonderful book on causation, which I highly recommend to you. But I've come to the conclusion that some of the causal people out there don't really understand this. They don't understand the hierarchical nature of some of the data sets with which we are used to working. And if one of the things, I think, which is clear was within the pharmaceutical industry now, we're all mixed model users. We all are used to the idea of error terms at different levels and different complexity, not just a simple regression model with one error term, but hierarchical models. Block structure may be co complex. More than one variance may be relevant. The way the design maps treatment onto block structure is determined, important. It determines the error term. Randomization of that which is declared irrelevant guarantees the marginal probability statements. We randomize that which we don't regard as being important. I'll come back onto that. And this in turn collaborates the conditional ones. Now, I'm going to go through a game of two dice, and here there's a very important assumption I'm going to have to make, which I think I can make fairly safely, and that is that you are not stupid. Because uh, basically, I'm going to go through a particular argument, I'm going to try and persuade you what a particular attitude is towards randomization. I regard this as being obvious, and of course, if you don't agree with me, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> then in that case, my basic assumption is wrong. <laughs> so this is the game with the two dice. Two dice are rolled. We have a red die and a black die, and you have to call correctly the odds of a total score of 10. I often say being a statistician means never having to say you're certain. That's the whole point. It's not just that we say yes or no, but what we say probably, maybe, perhaps, and we assess this. By the way, it drives my wife mad. She says, Stephen, just say yes or no. That's what she says, you know, rather than say, well, maybe, you know, and so forth. But that's basically what we statisticians are. It's not a question of whether something is true or wrong. It's a question of to what degree we believe it's true and what degree we believe it's wrong. And that's basically what we have to try and say. So here, the object is not to predict what the role of the dice will be. It's to say with what probability the particular event will occur because that's what you have to bet on. So there are three variants. Uh, in game one, you call the odds and the dice are uh, called together, and you have to correctly call the odds of a total score of 10. We'll go through the calculation. You call the odds, the dice are then rolled. Calling the odds is important because there's another person called the gambler, and the gambler will then decide to put money down uh, on the odds occurring or not, depending on the odds you call. If you get them wrong in the long run in this particular game, you will end up paying money to the gambler. It's important for you to get the odds right. In game two, the red die is rolled first, you're shown the score, and you must then call the odds after that. In game three, the red die is rolled first, you are not shown the score, neither is the gambler, uh, but you must then call the odds. It's rolled, but it's then hidden, and you must call the odds. So this is the game. I've created a little table. This is what statisticians grandly put, call the sample space. Uh, and I've got the red die score and the black die score. And what I've done is I've calculated for you, so you don't have to do it yourself, the total that uh, results from the, uh, the, two, uh, the two dice. Because you know what they say. There are three kinds of statisticians, those who can count and those who can't. Um, so here we have, that's a joke by the way, uh, so here we, here we have uh, the particular events that are of interest. There are three possible combinations out of the 36 in which the total score is 10. We're to assume that the dice are fair, everything is independent, and so therefore we can calculate the probability 
that we will get a score of 10 is 3 out of 36 is 1 over 12. That's game number one. This is now variant two. What happens is you will be shown the uh, red die score and you then have to bet. And this is where it's important not to be stupid. Because if you are shown that the score is one, two or three, then there is no way in which you can get a value of 10. If you were to bet under those circumstances that the probability was one twelfth of getting a 10, you'd be an idiot. Similarly, however, if the score is five, six or seven, then there is now a one in six chance of getting a 10, not a one in 12 chance. If you were to say that the probability is one in 12, you would again be an idiot. So the moral here is you have to use the information you've been given to change your probability assessment. If you don't do that, you're an idiot. Variant number three, you haven't seen what the red die shows, but you can argue like this. There's half a chance that it'd be one, two, or three, in which case the probability is zero. There's one half a chance that it would be four, five, or six, in which case the probability is six, and if you marginalize, if you average over those two cases, you come back to one twelfth. So the moral here is case three is like case one, but case two is radically different. So why am I telling you all this? Because you're all clever enough to see this, but I predict that you will come into contact with people who will say, oh, because you randomized, you can ignore covariates. That's like saying, because you rolled both dice together, you can ignore what the red die has shown you if it's shown to you when you bet on the total. That is simply illogical. And what you have to understand is the following. Randomization guarantees the marginal probabilities. And that's important because the marginal probabilities are calibrating. The conditional probabilities have to, when weighted appropriately, come to the marginal probabilities. And that's valuable and that's calibrating. But the marginal probabilities are not an excuse for ignoring the conditional probabilities. The conditional probabilities are relevant once you have seen the conditional event. If you deny this, if you say that because a clinical trial has been randomized, I can ignore prognostic covariates, you are the sort of person who equivalently is saying game two can be played like game one. I tell you, the gambler will take your money if that's what you do. Well, tell me why it's not true. How, how is it, uh, can you, can you uh, explain the analogy a little well, better? Because, because what, you're, what you're doing is you're using the average property of the game, but unfortunately the average doesn't apply to the particular event. It's so what I say. It's like, if the, fo the following is another analogy. You are flying to back to America or whatever, and at 25,000 feet or 35,000 feet above the Atlantic, the news comes through. Unfortunately, four engines are on fire and the captain has had a heart attack. Right? If you are an unconditional inference, you could say, why worry? On average, air travel is very safe. Because basically what you're saying is, you're saying, well, you know, so what? This is a particular case, but it's the average that's relevant. The average is not relevant when you see a particular case. That is, as far as I can see, it's unescapable. But I do maintain that people who say that therefore the average is not relevant are also wrong. Because the average is calibrating for the individual conditional inf inferences. But we can maybe come back to that later, Cyrus. So I think I've already said all of that. Um, you must use, basically, uh, um, prognostic information analyzing a clinical trial. So the critics of randomization, what do they say? Um, well, um, these are some of the things. Erbach, for example, says, you know, why this big fuss about randomization? You might as well let the patients choose. This is Peter Erbach. Uh, John Worrell. 
okay, so you randomize, but there are infinitely, infinitely many things that uh, could vary, and there's bound to be the case that something is particularly different between the two groups, and if that's the case, well, in that case, the whole thing is hope hopeful. Borgeson also, similarly, but basically her argument boils down to as Worrell has shown. So Worrell's particular argument has been accepted by a number of people. Deaton and Cartwright recently, and actually a very intelligent um, and generally sound view of the randomization have said, yeah, but if the data are skewed, then randomization doesn't help you much. And Krauss recently has said you should balance the patients at the start of the trial. Rather than randomizing, that's what you should do. So these are some quotations. Again, I'll, I'll uh, uh, let you read them. But here, Merbach says, one could simply permit the subjects to choose their own groups. Here's Worrell, as Lindley pointed out, even if this was a sing convincing for the case of a single confounder, it's not even clear that the argument works on its own terms when we take into account the fact that there are indefinitely many confounders. So, so many confounders, it wouldn't work. So that's, that's John Worrell, a philosopher of science. And then here we have uh, Borgeson. In order to begin to address the problem of confounding factors of randomization, we'd have to repeat it an indefinite number of times. You'd have to keep on randomizing, keep on randomizing in order to make sure that everything was balanced and that would never do. Uh, Deaton and Cartwright, we do not need balance on each case individually, only on the net effects, but consider the human genome base pairs. Out of all those billions, only one might be important. Billions and billions of things, and one of them could be imbalanced, and then it would all have been to nothing, the randomization. And then Krauss, uh, some researchers argue this method can minimize selection bias through blind randomization, yet this can only also be achieved by many other means of blinding. It is blinding, not randomization, that is important. That's what he says. Uh, Krauss, again, um, <coughs> as long as there are important balances, we cannot interpret the different outcomes between the treatment and control group as simply reflecting the treatment's effectiveness. I'm not going to read through the first one. So to sum up the claims, Trials aren't perfectly balanced. There are indefinitely many confounders. We could do better by creating equal groups. Blinding is important, but randomization isn't. We might as well let the patients choose which blinded group they join. So, um, balance isn't necessary. That's the first thing to understand. It's not necessary for a clinical trial to be balanced to produce a valid analysis. Uh, probability matters. It's all about ratios. So. Let me explain here. Here's a tale of two tables. So the first one is sadly imbalanced. You've got 34 versus 26 in the male stratum, virum versus placebo, uh, and you've got uh, 15 versus 25. So the true treatment versus the mock treatment, the placebo, 15 versus 25. <coughs> so people say, well, the first one must be more reliable. The second one must be more reliable than the, than the first one because it's balanced. But things are not so simple, because actually, if you look closely, you will see that trial two contains trial one. Uh, what I've got here is I've written trial two with the trial one numbers, and then I've added the particular numbers that would produce the imbalance. So if it were the case that somehow trial two was unreliable, was reliable, but trial one was not, it would mean that more information was worse than less. And that is ludicrous. Any statistical theory which says that's the case is wrong. More information must be better than less. And if both of the trials are randomized, although it's unfortunate that you would get that degree of imbalance, then you can't say that trial two is better than trial one. Trial one is better than trial two. What you need to do is you need to analyze appropriately. And going back to my uh, two, di analogy, two dice analogy, what you need to do is you need to condition on sex in the model. If you do that, you will eliminate the sex effect and you will then have got a valid analysis. What you can say is other things being equal, given the same number of patients, it would be better to have a balanced number. But this is not a question of validity of the inference. It's a question of efficiency of the inference. A balanced design is more efficient. You make it valid by conditioning appropriately. This infinite number of confounders is such a stupid argument, it makes me really angry. Here's an argument I can make that's equivalent. The series, one plus a half plus a quarter plus an eighth, doesn't converge because there are infinitely many terms. That's ridiculous. The total is bounded by two. You can continue the, ter the terms as many times as you like, you will not get above two. 
The fact that there are indefinitely many confounders does not mean that the total effect of these particular things is not bounded. And as soon as you try to simulate the problem, you come across a particular uh, corresponding realization. It's pointless simulating indefinitely many confounders. What I'm interested in is I'm interested in their combined effect. Is the effect of these things together different in one group from another? So suddenly we're reduced to one confounder only. The one confounder only is what would have happened had I treated this particular patient the other way around? That's it. The infinite confounders can help you predict that, but there cannot be infinitely many terms having an important influence on the outcome. If that were the case, the variance would simply blow up for patients in total. That's not possible. And here's an example. Uh, I do a simulation here, and I don't bound the predictors, and it's just ridiculous. As I increase the number of predictors, the distribution just gets wider and wider and wider and wider and wider. You're not free to do that. You must bound the total effect of the predictors, because otherwise you get blood pressure of thousands of millimeters of mercury when you simulate the effect uh, on a particular uh, patient. That's impossible. So the sum total is bounded, and so, Bo uh, so Worrell's argument is completely false. He's made a false assumption in doing that. And similarly, Deaton and Cartwright are making a false assumption. They're talking about billions, billions of base pairs, and they're simultaneously assuming that a rare event has occurred and that the rare event is important. And this is probabilistically nonsense. The probabilistic argument that the brandomization gives is still valid. It's not vulnerable to this particular objection. There's only one covariate that matters at potential outcome. And furthermore, the t-statistic is based on the ratio of dis differences uh, between and within. Um, so the error is to assume that because you can't use randomization as justification for ignoring information, it's useful, it's useful for what you don't see. Randomization is valid for what you haven't seen. It should not be as an excuse for ignoring what you have seen. So I'm going to consider a particular example. This is a famous, uh, this is an example of enuresis or um, uh, bedwetting, basically. Um, and a crossover trial, it appears in a famous paper by Hills and Armitage. Uh, and what we have here is we have um, the number of dry nights under placebo on the x-axis, the number of dry nights under drug on the y-axis. The two sequences are color-coded. Uh, the patients have been randomized between the two sequences. The diagonal line is the line of equality. Any particular point above the line suggests that that patient had more dry nights under the active treatment than under placebo. So, how would we analyze this? Well, we have to re reflect the block structure. So this is analyzing it two different ways. By the way, um, we had a discussion this morning as well regarding the propensity score. One of my objections to using the propensity score is that it doesn't tell you how to analyze experiments correctly. If you recall to when you were uh, studying statistics, if you analyzed a match pairs T design as if it was a completely randomized design, then in that case, you failed that question and deserve to do so. Now, there's a difference here between these two. This is the, uh, the distribution of the permuted uh, treatment effect. Uh, the effect is the same. It's given by the blue diamond. That is the average difference between the uh, dry nights and the wet nights. One of the distributions here reflects the fact that uh, the same patient was treated on two different occasions. That's the narrower one, the red one. The black one ignores this. And what you can see, that although the point estimate is exactly the same, my inference is completely different. By conditioning on patient, which is the red curve, what I get is I get a much, much narrower distribution. And so in consequence, I have a much more unusual event. The event is unusual compared to the permutation distribution. And this is, again, one of the things that the critics of randomization have ignored is if if covariates differ very, very greatly from one patient to another, we will see that in the residual error term. And we make a judgment of the efficacy of something compared to the residual term. And this is the summary of the statistics. If you have a look at the uh, case on the left-hand side, which is no blocking, I treated this as if it was completely randomized, then in that case, the p-value is 0.034. 
marginally significant. If I recognize that the same patient was treated on two different occasions, so the way I do the permutation distribution is I simply flip the two possible values patient by patient, not randomly choosing them across the whole distribution, I get a p-value of 0 0.0014. So what we find is we find that we have a, a randomization theory which uh, works very well, and this, by the way, is the parametric approach. The parametric answer is almost identical to the particular randomization answer here. So we get a p-value of 0 0.028. Parametrically, it was 0 0.034 for the permutation distribution. For the patient effect, it's 0 0.00147, and for the permutation, it's 0 0.0014. The moral here is more important than deciding to use a linear model or a permutation test is conditioning on that which is actually the block structure of the experiment. It's blocked by patient. That must be reflected in the analysis. And this is what happens if you balance but don't condition. Uh, the variance of the estimated treatment effect completely randomized and analyzed as such would be, uh, all would be correct. The variance is equal to the, um, the variance of the treatment effect. The true variance is equal to the mean of the variance. Uh, the randomized within patient, it's again, it's a smaller variance because I've actually reflected the fact I'm controlling my patient. But they're the same. But if what I do is I randomize within patient and analyze is completely randomized, I get a complete, mix match, mi uh, complete mismatch. The true variance is completely different from the posted one. And here's another surprise. I've actually increased the variance I've estimated from 0.996 to 1.005. You actually, by balancing and not conditioning, you make a mess of the inference. That's in terms of t statistic. I will skip that. But this is the shocking truth. The validity of conventional analysis of randomized clinical trials does not depend on covariate balance. It is valid because they are not perfectly balanced. If they were balanced, the standard analysis would be wrong. Randomization is necessary for blinding. So people like Krauss who say we should blind but not randomize uh, completely miss the point. How could you have... Uh, an effective randomization unless you blind an experiment. Um, uh, Worrell makes the same mistake. I shall leave you to read this at some other stage. If you don't randomize, you have to assume that your strategy is not being guessed by the investigator. Uh, people, by the way, are particularly stupid about this. I really get annoyed by people who don't publish the block size in the protocol. They say, oh, if I publish the block size, the investigator will guess, will know, you know. And I say, well, what was the block size? And they say, four. All right, okay. And last time you ran a clinical trial, what was it? Four. Yeah. And the time before that, four. We always use four. But we never tell the investigator, you know. So, I mean, you know, for goodness sake, let's be grown-ups about this. If you worry about the investigator guessing what the treatment allocation is, use a large block size. Don't use a small block size and then imagine by not having published it, you've done something clever. This is really stupid in my opinion. Deaton and Cartwright, so again, I need to move on because I'm in danger of running over time, but I, I did a simulation from the example that they had. I think they got their simulation wrong. I didn't see any particular problem with skewed data. When I did the randomization distribution, I got pretty much um, uh, a simulation. When I did the sort of parametric analysis using a simulation, I got p-values that were not that radically different from 0 0.05. And if anything, what happened when I skewed was I tended to get p-values that were too small rather than too large. That was my distribution. Erbach's idea. He said, Erbach, let the patients choose. Let the patients choose whether they get A or B. Don't tell them what's A and what's B, but let them choose. Now, do we know for sure that patients have no sort of strange prejudice for a -ing in favor of B? They might do, and if they do, what will the effect on efficiency be? If they choose A in preference to B, then in that case we'll have more patients in one arm than another. Is that what we want to do? So if you think about it as a Bayesian way, these are possible beta distributions here. These are possible beta distributions for what might happen if we allow the patients to choose A or B. One of these beta distributions, one, has an alpha of infinity and a beta of infinity, 
and that gives you a value of 0.5 and it's a degenerate distribution, it's collapsed completely about 0.5. This particular distribution is known as the randomization distribution. So randomization is better than every single possible one of Urbach's alternatives. Unless it just so happens that patients themselves are split amongst each other randomly so that 50% choose A and 50% choose B, or with probability A or B. So this again is a nonsense example. People talk, they make proposals without actually working through the consequences of this. For me, the devil is in the detail. If you haven't analyzed a clinical trial, don't talk about how to do it. So my philosophy of clinical trials is as follows. Your reasonable beliefs dictate the model. We use what we know about what happened in the past to choose the model. People say, oh, how will I know what the covariates are in this particular model, this particular clinical trial? I say, well, you know, here's a clue. This is about the 50,000th time that we run a clinical trial in asthma. Why don't you think a bit about what worked in the past? for our example, rather than just saying, oh, I must decide which covariates to use in this particular clinical trial. We've got some past experience. You should try and measure what you think is important. You should try fit what you've measured. Careful here, there is a caveat to the Gauss-Markov theorem which says in, in principle you can't do better than the linear model. This is not quite true when you randomize. In theory, least squares is not quite optimal, but that's a deep topic I don't want to go into. If you can balance what is important so much, the better, but fitting is more important than balancing. Randomization deals with unmeasured covariates. You use the distribution in probability of unmeasured covariates. The actual distribution should be used of anything you observe that you regard as being important. That should be in the model. Claiming to do conservative inference is just a convenient way of hiding bad practice. It's just a way of increasing the number of patients that you use. It's not quite as bad as that evil, evil, habit of dichotomizing data, that is really disgusting, but, um, but uh, ignoring prognostic covariates is nearly as bad. What's out and what's in? The log rank test, we can bin that. T-test on chain scores, no thank you. Chi-square tests on two by two tables, I doubt it. Responder analysis and dichotomies should never be used. You should never, ever, ever do a responder analysis because I might find out. Uh, balancing as an excuse for not conditioning. What's in? Proportional hazards models, analysis of covariance fitting baseline, logistic regression fitting covariates, analysis of original values, modeling as a guide for designs. Those things are in. Uh, I've already said that. In principle, you should never be worse off by having more information, but the ordinary least squares approach has two potential losses in fitting covariates. There's a loss of orthogonality and the loss of degrees of freedom. That means eventually we lose by fitting more covariates. So some sort of penalized method in theory would be better, um, but I'm not going to go into that. Um, to sum up, there are a lot of people out there who fail to understand what randomization can and cannot do for you. I like randomization, but it's not the be all and end all. We need to tell them firmly and clearly what they need to understand. The RCT may be 70 years old, but it still looks quite lively. Finally, I leave you with this thought. This is R.A. Fisher at Mablethorpe. Uh, Mablethorpe is a seaside resort on the um, coast, Lincolnshire coast, uh, where it frequently rains and there's not much sun. Basically, nobody in their right mind would go there for a holiday, but post-Brexit, who knows, you may find there are lots of British suddenly going to Mablethorpe. This is R.A. Fisher. I'll leave you with this particular thought. Statisticians are always tossing coins, but do not own many. People should pay us more. Thank you very much.